Boo. Hello, everyone. Whoever everyone is, the three people that are gonna watch this. Um, hi. What's up? Hello. Layla. You have something to say? Welcome to what I hope is gonna be the first of several uh, videos like this one, but maybe with better hair. We're having a bad hair day. We're not gonna let it affect us too much because it's always gonna affect us a little, right? I mean, good God, right? Um, welcome to 10 Day Brews, something that I have just dreamt up this morning, actually, and now I'm here doing. This series is gonna be a brewing series, and I've been debating for a long time starting a series about brewing, about home brewing, because there's so many good home brewing YouTube channels out there that deserve uh, the views, probably more than I do, but the majority of the brews that I do, majority of the beers that I make, are start to finish in 10 days or less. I mean, grain to glass in 10 days or less, generally. Um, I am, what can I say, okay? I am of a new generation of home brewer who is always looking for uh, the quickest way to make great beer. And um, there's lots of good resources on this. I mean, Brewlosophy does their short and shoddy series. You can check that out on brewlosophy.com. You know, they're doing everything short. They're doing shorter boils, shorter mashes. They're pushing the limits of what can be done in a small amount of time and still make great beer. Um, and this year, 2020, there've been a lot of developments in that front, you know? We've learned a lot about beer and the fact that you can still make great beer by cutting out some of the steps that brewers have been doing for years and that, you know, kind of the stuff that we always thought we needed to do, but we're learning now we don't necessarily need to, we just always have been doing it. So me, just having started brewing this year, being extremely impatient as a human being, um, I'm about it, like I'm about it, about it. You know, when it comes to cutting corners, but still making great beer, that's everything that I want, okay? So uh, we are, you know, I don't mean to offend any, uh, I don't even wanna use the term old school brewers. I don't wanna offend any brewers in general um, who believe that doing things the traditional way, the long way is the best because I do think, you know, there's certain things that are undeniable. Some beers just need to condition longer um, to be better. However, I'm here to show you along with many other brewers recently that you can make great beer in a short amount of time. So that's what this series is about. I appreciate you sticking around for this hellishly long introduction of me just talking um, and wasting your time effectively. Uh, but we are going to make beers of all different styles, all different kinds, all different grain bills, different hops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in less than 10 days, grain to glass. That's kind of the idea behind this. Today, we're going to be making a raspberry vanilla stout. I already have a name for it. It's called Inverse Effects. And um, I am in the process of kind of getting it going. We're here, man, we're out here. We're the young brewers, okay? The young, impatient brewers looking to cut corners and take over the world and do it extremely quickly. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and um, do a couple things to get started here. I have my grains. I just need to get them all weighed and measured. We need to go get some water. Um, I will explain a little bit more about the water that I'm gonna be using and get my ingredients together, get the burner going and uh, watch the cat drink some water extremely entertaining. Um, but yeah, I also have to put together my grain mill. I got a, a new grain mill from Northern Brewer, their whole wrecker, kind of their budget grain mill. I didn't need a big one. Um, and I have a drill, so I don't need one with a motor. So I bought that, I need to put it together, which I expect to be um, well, extremely simple and weirdly time consuming is what I'm expecting from that. So. We'll see how that goes. I'll, I'll, I'll cut to a time lapse of that. Let's do a time lapse of building the freaking whole record, brother. We built the whole record. Here it is. Um, it was weirdly time consuming, exactly as I thought, but also extremely easy. So, um, also, I'm, re I'm recording a lot of this on my iPhone. I have a camera. I don't know. Um, I, it's easier. Um, so I apologize if the audio is a little bit lacking or there has like some delay. Modern phones though, I mean, come on, this is just as good as my camera. Although I do have a Rode mic on my camera, but it's acting up, so I'm not using it. Um, but here's the thing. I have my grains already pre-milled for this recipe, right? But I'm going to mill them again because we do brew in a bag. By we, I mean me. Um, but you're included in that now. I'm going to mill them a second time to maximize efficiency. 
Um, it's debated whether or not that's totally necessary. I don't have the answer as to whether or not it is, but I'm just so desperate for efficiency because I suck at brewing. So we're, why not? You know, why not take the extra time and just mill the grains twice? So we're gonna do that. Um, first, I'm gonna go get some water. So I will see you guys at the freaking water vending machine dispenser. The, the water dispenser up the street from my house where we're going. Okay, come on. Okay, so uh, we do have the strike water heating. Uh, this particular recipe calls for almost exactly seven gallons, 7.01. I apologize if the burner is super loud, but there it goes. Um, I will show the recipe up on the screen here in a second. I'm going to go ahead and weigh out and then mill the grains that are necessary. Um, again, about 7.01 gallons. I do have water adjustments. I'll put the water profile on the screen as well for you guys so you know. I will kind of walk through the adjustments as I add them also. Um, this is the first time I'm doing one of these videos, so the format may be a little uncertain of itself, but hoping it'll work itself out over time. So we're gonna bust out the new grain mill here and uh, get all the grains weighed and uh, measured and counted. I'm gonna count each individual one. The key is you have to take each individual grain whole and you, you kiss it, you give it a little kiss before you put it into your beer. Um, promotes the enzymatic activity that's going to happen during the mash. So I'm going to strike my water to about 165. I'm aiming for a mash temp of about 156. And um, that's going to leave a little bit of residual sugar, hopefully in the finished beer. Um, it is cloudy. It is a beautiful cloudy day here in Marietta, California. I'm hoping against hope that it does not rain. It's supposed to rain tomorrow, but not today. I am brewing in the backyard. You can see the climbing wall behind me. Um, sincerely hoping that it does not rain just yet because that would suck if it rained. So let's get the grains going. Okay, so we have gotten the majority of the grains uh, double milled. Again, I did mention earlier that these grains I actually purchased milled and I am milling them again. Um, I will dive very, very shortly into the, uh, the reasoning for that. Um, doing a brew in a bag setup, it is imperative to get good efficiency that you have a very fine mill on the grains. So um, most people will even double mill their grains at the lowest setting. Um, I am extremely close to the smallest setting on the rollers for the grain mill. Um, and I know that at the homebrew shop that I purchased the grains from, I know that when they mill them, they use probably a medium or a higher setting um, to allow the homebrewer to choose what they want more specifically. So um, we have double milled them. They are extremely finely milled. Now it's almost like powder. Um, which is going to be good for efficiency for a brew to bag setup. So our strike water is extremely close to being at the correct temperature. I think I'm at about 160 right now. So I'm going to submerge my bag in the, uh, the hot water and get going. I also need to get my flaked oats here. Now, a little tip for you all at home. The flaked oats that you can buy from your homebrew shop, it's good to support your local homebrew shop. They're about identical to just the rolled oats you can get at the grocery store. And these are like a quarter of the price. For me, it may be different at your homebrew shop. So again, it's good to support your local homebrew shop, but I'm gonna weigh out a pound of these oats. Now that you guys have seen the grist, the recipe as far as the grain bill for this, um, let me know what you think. I think we are running low on gas, so I'll have to change out a gas cylinder here soon, but I do have a spare, so. Actually, one more thing I forgot um, before I go ahead and drop the bag and get the grains into the mash here. We're gonna go ahead and do our water adjustments, which I will show on the screen. Um, I won't talk too much into that because that would take a long time to explain, but I will show what my water profile is and what I am adding to this. Again, this is reverse osmosis water. So currently it has no mineral content at all. I'm going to be adding the salts that I desire, you know, to get to my desired flavor profile for the water. So um, water chemistry, I can explain in a future video, even though I myself don't know it that well just yet. Um, but certainly if you have any questions, drop them in the comment section and I'll see what I can do.
conditions, we are at our desired water profile from our base of reverse osmosis water. I also added five milliliters of lactic acid to make sure that my mash pH is uh, low, about 5.2 it should come to. I do not have a pH meter, so I'm trusting my calculators. Thank you, brewersfriend.com, for all of your assistance keeping me afloat here. But um, yeah, it's important to keep the pH low, especially in a grist like this where I have a lot of, well, a relatively high amount of uh, darker roasted grains um, because if I have a higher pH with those toasted roasted uh, you know darker colored grains I can pull a ton of astringency and really harsh bitterness so I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that we want a nice balance of malty flavor in this beer with a good you know balance of bitterness to the good sweet malty character so um, we have a adjusted to the desired water profile now I'm gonna go ahead and back the camera up for you here and then we're gonna drop the bag in get the grains going and begin an hour 60 minute match. <laughs> Okay, so we are mashed in the grain has been added here as you can see to the kettle. Um, I'm a little bit below my target temperature. Um, I had to stir a bit more than expected because um, one thing to note when you're crushing your grains extremely finely, they do have a tendency to dough up and form dough balls. So um, this would be a little bit easier with two people or I could have just poured the grain in slower, certainly. But um, here we are, we're a little bit below temperature. I'm at like 153 right now. So I am going to lift the bag up for just a second and heat the bottom of the kettle just to get it up a few degrees because it is a little chilly out today. I do expect to lose a couple degrees uh, during my 60 minute mash even though I have you know sort of a homegrown method for keeping this thing warm which is wrap a sleeping blanket around it or a sleeping bag excuse me um, so I'm gonna heat it up just a little bit and get closer to my mash temperature 156 so that it spends more time around that temperature um, and then we'll begin the mash closer to that 156 target mash temperature. I'm going to go ahead and cover this thing up now. There are lots of ways to adjust your mash temperature. What I just did was probably the most work, to be honest, and anyone who's watching probably knows that. Um, the easiest way is just to add a little bit of boiling water to adjust that temperature up or, you know, drop in your wort chiller for a couple seconds if you want to cool it down. So there are easy ways to adjust your mash temperature. And while it's not that important, um, I don't know, man. I've been told it is, so we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and just get it up to where it's supposed to be. Now I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this thing up and then we're going to begin our 60 minute mash. Hopefully all goes well. Okay, so we are now into our 60 minute mash. It is probably a good time for me to talk a little bit about what I expect from this beer, what I'm hoping from the beer. Um, like I said, it's going to be a raspberry vanilla stout. Um, it's my first stout that I've ever brewed, actually. I could use a beer right about now. I should go get one. Um, but anyways, um, as far as, you know, the grain bill was relatively simple and pretty basic for a stout. Um, you know, Maris Otter base. I wanted a little bit of extra maltiness that comes from the Maris Otter as opposed to just the Pale Two Row, which I also have. Um, you know, about 7% crystal 80, 7% chocolate malt, about 3% roasted barley, and then about 7% flaked oats. So sort of maybe a little bit of an overcomplicated grist in this one, but um, I do think it'll work well for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, this beer, again, being a 10-day beer from grain to glass, um, I am going to be using uh, the Lalamond uh, Voskvayak yeast. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but from what I've looked up, neither does anyone else. I'm going to be using that yeast because it is exceptionally quick. Um, the last beer that I used that yeast, I believe was terminal in like 30 hours. And that was like a 1060 beer. So this will probably be like a 1065 beer, I think, or something like that, depending on my efficiency, which um, I expect to get about 60%, but this is the first time I've double milled the grains. So it's possible that I'll get higher than that. Um, I'm expecting this will be anywhere from like a 1059 to a 1065 original gravity beer. So um, that gives us a little bit of wiggle room. This is normally about when I grab my beer because now I just have to sit here for 60 minutes. So uh, let's go see what we got in the beer fridge, yeah? So 
So here's what we got going on at the moment in the beer fridge. I will quickly run through some of this stuff considering this is my first beer brewing related video on my channel. And I just wanna let you guys know kind of what we got going on. We have a non-alcoholic pomegranate wheat. Um, this keg here is the remainder of that uh, pomegranate wheat batch that is alcoholic. This is a uh, imperial pumpkin spiced ale with coffee and vanilla. This is a shitty chai cider that is not good, but I'm saving it to see if those four bottles get good over time. Uh, here we have Sinner's Resolve, the Irish red ale with vanilla beans. Um, everything that says PP on it would be a pineapple pale ale. I also have the, uh, a half keg of the pineapple pale. And here we have a strawberry milkshake IPA, which I'm extremely excited about. Um, here is a hazy double IPA that was part of the same batch as the strawberry milkshake IPA. I'll probably do a video about that split batch soon. We have my flagship. We have my flagship banana tusks, banana cream ale. This is the beer that I have that people seem to just love the most of. I only have two cans of that. Those are for me. And then we have Explorers Ale, which is my American blonde ale, brewed for adventure, a perfect outdoor beer, perfect camping companion. Um, I think I'll have a hazy IPA, the hazy double IPA today. So I was sitting here about to crack open my beer and I had an amazing realization. I forgot to add the oats to the mash. So I'm gonna go ahead and uncover this and just sprinkle these bad boys in, stir it up a little bit. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. Okay, so um, I added the oats in. No big deal, right? Right? No brew day goes perfectly without any issues. It just doesn't happen. So um, we did get our beer. This wonderful hazy IPA that I brewed recently. It's a hazy double IPA. I mean, look at the color, brother. It's got like kind of a nasty glare off of the glass right now, but it's phenomenal. Okay, so we have been about 60 minutes into the mash now, and the sun has come out, as you can see. Good lord, that's bright. I have not opened this up to stir it or check the temperature, so I'm really just gonna see what kind of temperature we got. Um, stir it up a little bit, pull the bag. I do squeeze the bag. You'll get different answers if you ask different brewing and bag brewers about that, but um, I personally do squeeze the bag. Uh, we're gonna be doing a short-ish boil today, about 45 minutes. Um, the hop additions are fairly simple. I'm going to be using a hop that is new to me. Uh, it's been around since about 2008, I believe, but um, I personally have no experience with it, but I thought um, that maybe it sounded like it'd be something cool to experiment with on this particular style, and that is this hop right here. This, uh, it's backwards for you, I know, but it is a, a Yakima Chief HBC 472. Now, I don't have any experience with this, like I said. Um, it is 9% uh, alpha acids, it's relatively high. Eh sort of like medium alpha acid content. Um, the aroma is described as oak slash bourbon wood, herbal, vanilla, floral, and tropical fruit. So, you know, while it's not exactly to style for what we're doing, and it may not be um, the hop that you would choose specifically to do a stout, um, I have been told that this particular hop can give you some like barrel aged characteristics without having to do any barrel aging, which is cool because we're doing this in 10 days. So um, I'm not gonna be dry hopping with it, but we're gonna do an ounce at 45 minutes remaining in the boil. So I guess an ounce is zero minutes um, and then another ounce at five minutes. So um, hopefully that'll give us some of the character of this hop and we'll be able to see what it's all about, man. So anyways, let's squeeze the hell out of this bag. What do you say? So here we are, post mash, chilling, half a beer in, had a sandwich as well, because that beer was going to my head immediately because I hadn't eaten in a while. Um, there's like some beautiful clouds going on right now. Ah, you can't make this shit up, dude. It's, it's gorgeous, glorious. Um, the bad hair day continues, unfortunately, but um, 
The bag is just dripping now. I have squeezed it. I have also taken my pre-boil gravity reading, uh, which I will show on the screen now, which as you can see is about 1056. Um, higher <laughs> than I expected, certainly. I expected about 1048. Fantastic news, don't get me wrong. What that tells me though, is that double milling the grains and milling them extremely finely uh, did make a big difference, actually. Um, I'm thinking that that's about the only thing that made a difference. I'm realizing that I took my glasses off because I can't see nothing. Um, I think that made a huge difference. So lesson learned for all you brew in a bag brewers, double mill your grains, mill them bitches real small. So we're bringing it up to a boil now. Um, and then we're gonna do our first hop addition, which again, we're using HBC 472 from Yakima Chief. I'm gonna do one ounce at zero minutes, I'm doing a 45 minute boil, and then we're gonna do another ounce at about five minutes. Nothing else is going into the boil, really. Um, doing a raspberry vanilla stout, you might say, hey, you could put some raspberries in the boil. Yeah, I could. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna. You'll lose most of the character. I mean, it's just not worth it. I don't think that I will get good returns if I put raspberries or raspberry powder, or raspberry puree or anything into the boil. Um, I think most of the flavor compounds are gonna be gone by the time I get done with fermentation. Uh, I've got more wort that is higher gravity than I was expecting. So it's a very, very rare problem to have. But then again, I'm, a, I'm just built different, you know? Just built different, absolutely. So um, we're gonna go into the boil here. There's probably not going to be a lot of footage happening because I'm just going to be sitting here 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, and then uh, into the fermenter. And the other nice thing about this that I'll talk a little bit more again after the boil is that we don't have to cool this down as much as you would expect or as much as you may normally have to for uh, a typical ale. So anyways, we'll see you soon. Okay, so the boil is complete. We boiled for 45 minutes. Uh, you saw the hop additions. They were, I, I edited them in just for you. All right, it's a beautiful sunset, by the way. It's wonderful. It was, it was a gloomy and cloudy day, but we have this beautiful sunset, which is very nice. A leaf just fell into my kettle. You can't make this shit up, dude. Look at this. Come here. I mean, it's my fault because there's trees and stuff and I'm brewing in the outdoors, but there's more coming for me, dude. They're falling out the sky. All right, well, I better move quick. So the boil's complete. Um, it's it's time to cool this thing. So I've got the wort chiller here. Now the wort chiller that I have is a little bit small for this kettle. It's a 15 gallon kettle, a very small wort chiller for like a five gallon kettle. Um, don't ask why, it's just the way that it is at the moment. So um, I'm going to cool this down. Now the best part about the uh, Kvayak yeast that I mentioned earlier is that I do not have to cool this down as much as you would think. Now, because it thrives at high temperatures, in fact, the, the optimum temperature range for that yeast is, I wanna say it's like 77 degrees to 105 degrees or something like that. It, this yeast, here's the packet by the way. It almost seems like this stuff uh, actually thrives at higher temperatures. So um, I'm going to cool this down to about 100 degrees and then I'm gonna throw it straight into the fermenter and we're gonna pitch this right about 95 uh, and I'm gonna wrap a heating pad around my fermenter. I have the fermenter over there. Um, I sprayed some sanitizer in it, but I'm gonna sanitize it again just to make sure everything's good. And then uh, chill this down to, like I said, about 100 degrees, pitch it, uh, pitch the yeast in and then I'm gonna to try to keep it warm. We want it to ferment in between 90 and 95 degrees because that'll be a fast fermentation, probably a particularly aggressive one as well. So I may have to rig a blow off setup for this one, but I don't think I will because I'm living life on the edge, I guess. Um, but anyways, let's chill it off and pitch our yeast in. Now, now, as I'm cooling this wart down, you can see I've got the wart chiller in there right now. There's water coming out of it. Um, just to go over how I do this really quickly, um, I put the wort chiller in and I turn up the water pretty high. So I have a pretty good amount of pressure actually coming out of the end of that thing. I want a consistent stream of water to get as much contact with cold water inside the piping as possible. Um, the water coming out of my faucet right now is probably 60 degrees, it's pretty cold. So, um, and then I'm going to actually grab the wort chiller and I'm gonna physically move it around inside the wort. While this is not the most sanitary method, um, I've never had problem 
problems with infection or anything doing it like this and this does cool it down a lot quicker uh, it's just the friction purely just the friction and the increased surface area against the piping of the war chiller is going to cool it down a lot quicker so um, let's do that and then uh, we'll be good to go Well, I mean, as far as this brew day goes, that's about it. It's about all I got. I mean, we're done. It's in there, it's in the fermenter. It's got its cute little heat wrap on. Um, I plug it into an outlet and it keeps it warm. You might be thinking to yourself, Liam, you're crazy, you're insane. You didn't aerate your wart hardly at all. You shook it up a little bit. Well, I'm telling you, man, this, this Kvike yeast, it just goes. It doesn't matter what I do or what you do or what anybody does. I promise you, it is Sunday right now at, uh, it's about 5 p.m. on Sunday. I promise you by this time on Tuesday, this beer will be terminal. It'll be done. Okay, I'm that confident in the power of this crazy Norwegian yeast. Okay, so that is it. Brew day complete. The beer is in the closet, which is where it will be fermenting. Um, the heating carboy heater, I realize that's what it's actually called, the carboy heater is on. Um, I expect it to be like air, full airlock activity by the time I go to sleep, to be honest. This, this uh, Kavai yeast is nuts, but um, it was a good day. It was a learning experience. I ended, remember when I said that I was shooting for like a 1059 to 1065 beer? Remember when I said those words in that order? Um, not even close, but in a good way. We finished at 1074. So um, again, I'm gonna chalk it up to the new uh, grain mill and the fact that I now have control over the milling of my grains and I can mill them much finer. Um, I have ended up with a much higher efficiency than I have learned to expect in the past. So. Um, it's a good thing, honestly, and moving forward, I'm excited to uh, to utilize my new efficiency on some recipes that I've done in the past and use less grain than I've been using before. So um, this has been it for the first episode of 10 Day Brews. Uh, this is the Inverse Effects Raspberry Vanilla Stout. I mean, thank you guys for watching. If you're still here, I, I don't know exactly how I want to format this series other than, you know, I just grabbed my phone today and my camera and just started recording. So. Let me know if you guys like the format, um, if there's something you would like me to change. Stick around, you know, and see how it goes. I'd love to talk more about the fermentation process. I will be checking it every day and hopefully making some uh, recordings and, and giving you guys updates. But uh, look out for part two, which will be... I'm thinking that there will only be two parts to each of these brews. So today was the brew day. Um, part two is going to be uh, some clips of fermentation, some gravity readings, some statistics, and then adding flavoring and packaging the beer. So really part two, we'll be finishing out this beer completely. And then maybe I'll do a part three that'll be like tasting after it's conditioned for a little while um, and it's been in cans. So other than that, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you liked or what you didn't like about this. Um, my arm's tired from holding my phone up on a freaking selfie stick all day. I don't know if the selfie stick format works well for you guys, but let me know if it has. And then I'm gonna edit all this together and uh, see how it goes. Again, any feedback, just let me know. Any questions, leave them in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. Merry Christmas.